Antena Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing Bhakti Shastri course. We're studying Bhagavad Gita and we're at chapter 16. We're studying the divine and demoniac natures. Hmm. So let me just uh, go to screen sharing. Right? We explained the relationship between the chapters. Do you remember? Chapter 14, describing the most of nature. Then chapter 15, describing the banyan tree. And now chapter 16, with the divine and the demoniac natures. So you can see the relationship between the chapters. What did I do? <laughs> right, so we're speaking about these two quality, these two natures. Daivi Sampad, Asuram Sampad, the divine and the demoniac. And there's nothing in between. There's only the two natures, divine and demoniac. We can't say I'm in between. We're a mixture, the devotee and the demon. So we spoke, we went through the different qualities, explaining these uh, 20, 20 qualities, is it? 26 qualities of divine nature and then we're going to go on to hear about the Asuric nature. Asuric nature was described with these six qualities, pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, ignorance. Oh, three more added from later in the chapter, lust, anger and greed. And Prabhupada speak, spoke about the importance of begetting children in God consciousness. Abhijatasya, one who's born with godly tendencies. And Prabhupada was very uh, pleased when a couple would announce that the, the, the wife was expecting a child and Prabhupada explained that these, these children are very important. The, the children taking birth in the Krishna consciousness movement are very fortunate souls because from the beginning of their life they have Krishna consciousness. Even within the womb they have the opportunity for Krishna consciousness. 
So Prabhupada wanted we would have nice children, just like Bhaktivinoda Thakur had a big family, he wanted his children to help him to preach and distribute the message of Lord Chaitanya. And of course, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. <coughs> Excuse me. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was one of the children who came, who appeared to help Bhaktivinoda Thakur in spreading the mission of Lord Ch 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 <coughs> Krishna. I seem to have a little cold this morning. So these demonic qualities, the demon just as the godly qualities come from birth. So, in the same way, the demonic qualities also come from birth. We know in Srimad Bhagavatam, Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu, how from the very beginning of their birth, even within the womb of their mother, there were so many signs of inauspiciousness. So the demons, within the womb of their mother, they begin to manifest all the inauspicious qualities. However, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, you don't have to worry, you're born with the divine qualities. Arjuna was not, uh, he was not demonic nature, he was very thoughtful before taking part in the battle. So Prabhupada says, one or the other, two kinds of natures. And Prabhupada gives us the example, we read this, right, about people in New York, as soon as we play the cartels and we have kirtan, oh, stop, call the police, get this out, we don't want this. So the demonic nature. And hearing the sound of the kirtan, the sound of the holy name, disturbs the demons. They become agitated and they want to stop it. So, verses 7 to 18 go on to describe the demoniac nature, and then the rest of the chapter describes the, the results of the demoniac activities. We'll hear about that at the end of the chapter. We're going to... Oh. One thing we didn't talk about was Ugra Karma. We, meant, we described a little bit about Devi Sampad and Asuri Sampad. But Ugra Karma, horrible activities meant to destroy the world. Things like atom bombs and uh, so many slaughterhouses, and especially killing the cows. That's all Ugra Karma. So much Ugra Karma in the world today. Maybe some of you have some realization of, or some. Uh, you can give some examples about Ugra Karma. Anyone? You know, one, at one point they had the mass, mass sterilization program in India. They wanted, uh, you know, they were worried about overpopulation and they were forcing all the people in the villages, they had to go for sterilization so they couldn't have children anymore. That is also Ugra Karma. Ugra Karma, uh, one, I, I know one devotee, he told me his uh, sister and her husband, they work for United Nations. And so I was very happy, I thought very nice. But then I found out what they do. He said, yeah, they work for United Nations, they're working on developing birth control techniques. They want more birth control. So, you know, that's Ugra Karma. Things like that. Just demonic activities. Any, any other examples you'd like to offer anyone? Ananta Velasa Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, an example on the same lines is abortion. Like we heard recently, like uh, they are planning to legalize abortion here. So that would be considered like Ogre Karma, like they are planning on abortion legalization. So that's a mass, mass Ogre Karma. Yes, definitely. Sadhguru, 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I heard in the news uh, that in the time of pandemic and coronavirus uh, in uh, Western countries, lots of minks were killed in a big scale because they were suspected to have coronavirus. So they were like gathered in one place and killed. And also, I heard in uh, Australia, I saw this news only. I mean, uh, after that mass fire, uh, lots of camels were shot and killed because of scarcity of water. So government particularly organized the killing of camels over the... Uh, killing of camels? Yeah, I heard in the news. In Australia? Yeah. Uh, news Maharaj, uh, I can uh, say more about it. That there was scarcity of water because uh, uh, there had to be a drought in particular areas like, you know, in the... the the middle of Australia is like a desert, mm -hmm. and uh, there is always scarcity for the water. So the, the camel drink a lot of water, and those water is people they want to utilize for their own uh, farm and things like that. So they kill a lot of camels. Yeah, they did. Well, I didn't know they had camels in Australia. Oh, plenty of <laughs> camels and wild horses. Plenty. Well, wild horses also. Yes, yes, Maharaj, in the outback. I thought it was only kangaroos over there. Yes, that's a common one, but uh, we have a lot of uh, camels and horses. Oh, okay. Yes, Ogra Karma. It's really their land. <laughs> They're the proprietors, these animals, but we kill them. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, going on. Maras, yes? Maras, can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, Maras, even uh, going against the natural resources like this deforestation to make so many factories, that also comes in the Rogar Karma. Oh, yes. Yes. Cutting all the trees, taking all the land which is meant for farming and agricultural purposes to build factories which are going to produce things for everyone's, for people's sense gratification. Yes. So it's Ugra Karma. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. So from the ninth, uh, 19th verse of the 16th chapter, those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence into various demoniac species of life. Here you can see the demoniac species of life. <laughs> Very unpleasant looking creatures, huh? And they're all souls, remember. So what kind of soul is it that gets that kind of body like this? So Krishna puts those people, these uh, lowest among men, Naradamas, or the envious, the mischievous, puts them into these demonic species of life again and again. And we may think, oh, is it fair to put them into these species of life, into such horrible demoniac species of life, birth after birth? It's what they want. These so they actually want that kind of body. They actually like that kind of body. This, so this is what they, Krishna fulfills the desire. He knows the desires of each and every living entity, and they get the appropriate body. So it's hard to imagine, but it's it's hard for people, those souls in these bodies, to imagine that we have our bodies. And they're, they're, they're thinking their body's very nice. Just like we know Indra was cursed to become a pig and he was happy. He was thinking, I'm happy, I don't want to leave. And so the same way these souls are put into these bodies, demoniac species of life, but they're happy. They're thinking, I'm very happy, this is my, my body, I'm having a good time. So this is the result of 
the demoniac mentality take birth again and again in this species of life. From the purport of that verse, therefore, in the material existence, we find so many species of life, animals, insects, men, and so on. All are arranged by the superior power. They are not accidental. As for the demoniac, it is clearly said here that they are perpetually put into the wombs of demons, and thus they continue to be envious, the lowest of mankind. So, 8,400,000 different species of life, because there are 8,400,000 different desires to accommodate, to accommodate the desires of each and every soul, they have the appropriate body. So just looking at them and understanding something of their mentality, it, it's so puzzling. We cannot imagine how they would like to have that kind of body. But this is the result of the demonic mentality. This is the result of being envious of the Supreme. So another well-known verse from the 16th chapter, Trividam narakashyaidam dwara nashnam atmana. Kama krodas tatalobas tasmat etat trayam chagat. So dwara, dwara, the gate, right? Ajmirak dwara. In Delhi, so many gates. So in the body, there's also gates, right? So into hell, there are three gates. In the body, we have nine gates. But to hell, three gates. Lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up, for they lead to the degradation of the soul. We should understand how the anger and greed relate to lust. We know earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, we heard that by contemplating the objects of the senses, a person becomes attached to them. And from such attachment, lust develops. Then from lust, anger arises. So anger is like the younger brother of lust. Why, do we, why does someone become angry? Because they, their, their desires, which they had, their lusty desires, are not satisfied. And because they're desires are not satisfied, they become frustrated and that frustration causes them to become angry and they display great anger. On the other hand, somebody's lusty desires may be fulfilled. They may get what they wanted and the result is they want more. They didn't get enough. Nobody ever says, I had enough. Everyone says, I want more, I want more. So this is the greed. So this way, three gates to hell. Lust, anger and greed. They lead to the degradation of the soul. We heard in Ishopanishad, of course you've not studied Ishopanishad yet, but when you do study Ishopanishad, you will hear there about the killer of the soul. The killer of the soul, Atmaha. So here, the degradation of the soul. Of course, the soul is pure. The soul also cannot be killed. But when we deny the interest of the soul, this is a problem. It takes us into the very inauspicious, unpleasant circumstances. 
You can see in the picture, the illustration on the slide, different ways in which the living entity is punished. This is different types of hell, how he's being bound up, and how he's being burned and cooked. And so, of course, this is the subtle body of the living entity. The gross body is left behind at the time of death, but the Yamaduras take the subtle body. They take the subtle body and drag him to Yamaraj. And Lord Yamaraj, he will hear what kind of activities the living entity has performed, and he will make a judgment. What is the suitable uh, treatment, what is the suitable punishment for him, or what kind of body should he get in the future? So, in the Mahabharata, there's a statement that one temple which everyone has to go to is Yamaraj. Everyone has to go there. You can't avoid going to that one. But the time of death, we're taken there. And Yamaraj will judge who is the sinful person. What have they done? Have they done any pious activities? And we get the results. We get the results of our actions. So this is the situation. We must be very careful to make proper use of the human form of life. Human form of life is a junction to determine the future. Either we go up or down or come back. Therefore, from Prabhupada's purport, raise oneself at least to the mode of goodness. Right? I think you're writing an essay about this, is it? Yeah. Uh, for your open book assessment, you have to write about the mode. So here's a nice quote from 16th chapter, verse 24. One has to raise himself at least to the mode of goodness before the path to understanding the Supreme Lord can be opened. Without raising oneself to the standard of the mode of goodness, one remains in ignorance and passion, which are the cause of demoniac life. How to raise oneself to the mode of goodness? Of course, that by the prescribed method of living and acting. Wake up at a good auspicious time, have a morning program, worship the deity. Of course, you have to take bath, taking bath two or three times a day, all of these different things, chanting every day, studying scriptures, eating only prasada. All of these things will ensure that we can keep ourselves in the mode of goodness, we can protect ourselves from the mode of passion and ignorance. Of course, we have to be careful how we use our time. If you spend the whole, you may get up early in the morning, go to Mongol Arti, and then come back and go to bed again. Or you may spend the whole day watching Bollywood movies. In so many ways, it's so easy. Every moment, we have to be on guard. We have to try to keep herself situated in the mode of goodness and beware of the influence of passion and ignorance. As we said, the devotee and the demon are both in the same body. So there's always a, the tendency, you know, the, the mind may be pulling us. Oh, don't do that. Oh, go there, do this. Oh, go ahead. You don't need to go to RT today. You went to RT yesterday. Yeah, go ahead, watch television, it's a really good movie, this, oh, this movie is really good, everybody watches it. The mind will always try to take us away from Krishna, the mind is testing us. How much do we want Krishna consciousness? So we have to be on guard to try to keep ourselves really fixed in the mode of goodness. Very important for us. This is another quote. This quote is from a lecture in Hawaii. Prabhupada's lecturing from the 17th chapter. This is, we're still on the 16th chapter, but this is a quote, a relevant quote from the 17th chapter. Without coming to the platform of Sadvagun, 
Nobody can advance in spiritual life. That is a fact. Just like nobody is allowed to enter the law college unless he is graduate. This restriction is there. What he will understand law, he must be a graduate. So similarly, first of all, one has to come to the platform of sattva gun. Then spiritual knowledge begins. So at least in India they have this custom that if you want to go into law college, you must first of all be a, a university graduate. You have to be, you have to reach the a proficiency. You have to become, you know, showed you're a good student. And then they will take you in the law college. They don't want people coming into law college who are not serious and who are not educated. Everybody has to have come up to the standard of being a university graduate. And then they're they will take you in the law college. So, the same way, we want to uh, come to the platform of Krishna consciousness, then one, we first have to come to the platform of sattva gun. And Prabhupada said, then spiritual knowledge begins. So, very important for us. Yeah, we have to get out of the mode of passion and ignorance. We have to come up to this mode of goodness. And then we can make proper spiritual advancement from that point. Of course, we take everyone. People come to Krishna consciousness, they're fully in the mode of ignorance or passion. But by taking part in the Krishna conscious activities, they will come to the mode of goodness and then from the mode of goodness they can go on. I remember one time we were on Harinam Sankirtan and a young woman, she was intoxicated on drugs and somehow she became attracted to the Sankirtan party and she joined the Sankirtan party and she came back to the temple with us and she became a devotee. And she's, and she's still a devotee. But initially, she was, she was in drugs, she was fully in the mode of ignorance. But because she came into the association of devotees, she associated with them, she took part in the program, she did service. So, she got rid of that ignorance and she came up to the mode of goodness and went on to become a nice devotee. Mm -hmm. So, just to overview what we looked at, links with the previous chapter, right? The relationships with chapter 14 and 15, the mode of goodness and the mode of passion and ignorance. And in chapter 15 it was the banyan tree, the upper branches in the tree, are the mode of goodness, the demigods, those people in the higher planets, they are all in the mode of goodness. And the lower branches of the tree, they are the animals and these kind of creatures, the mode of passion and ignorance. Human beings also, we are also in the lower part of the tree. Then chapter 16, divine nature is the mode of goodness and the demoniac nature, the modes of passion and ignorance. Then the significance of the word abhijatasya in relation to imbibing divine and demoniac qualities from birth. So it's a fact, everyone has their nature from birth. If someone's a demon, demoniac nature from birth, somebody else is a divine nature from birth. It can be changed, but it takes time. It's going to take time and it's a troublesome effort. It's so much better if you can, if one can be born with the divine qualities. Yes, the demon can become a devotee, but it, it, it takes time, it takes a lot of effort. We see Jaga and Madhai could become devotees, they got special mercy from Lord Chaitanya. So, it's not every time that 
you can become, you can, people can be changed just like that, spontaneous. That was very special, Jagai and Madhai. Okay. Preaching. The destination of those who develop demoniac nature with reference to Bhagavad Gita. Where do they go? The demoniac nature? They go into the lower species of life. They take birth in demoniac species of life, birth after birth. Examples of divine and demoniac nature from current world affairs. Divine nature. Distributing prasadam to people during the lockdown. That's a very divine nature. Or performing sankirtan, giving the chanting of the holy name to people. And the demoniac nature? Call the police. Get these people, get these Hare Krishna people locked up. <laughs> this is the demon. Examples of Ugra Karma from current society. We spoke about the slaughterhouses and nuclear power and, and then taking viruses from animals, from creatures like bats and so on and getting, somehow giving these, these vi giving these viruses to other people. This Ugra Karma. A quote from Srila Prabhupada from chapter 16, verses 2 to 7. So these godly characteristics are there. Either you practice yourself to come to the godly characteristics or there is a simple method. If you take to devotional service, all the godly qualities automatically come. This is the process. So, in this age, to develop these godly qualities is very difficult. But, if you take to Krishna consciousness by the simple method, by chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, then automatically you develop all the godly qualities. Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki. So Prabhupada is making the point that to develop these godly qualities is very difficult. But if we just simply take to the Krishna conscious process through chanting the holy name, automatically good qualities come. Can you give an example? Anybody like to give an example? Somebody who just became Krishna conscious and he developed all good qualities? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj Valmiki Ritman, so when, before he was a hunter, and Narad Muni praised him to uh, take the names of Lord Rama, chant the uh, names of Lord Rama, and he became a devotee. Yes, Makarari the hunter. Very good example. Thank you. Magrari the hunter was killing the animals in the most cruel way. He'd have them caught in traps and they would die a slow and painful death. But and Narada Muni came and he saw the situation. So he, he released the animals. But then he approached the hunter and he told the hunter that this is not good. But the hunter said, this is how I live. My father taught me to do this. He said, this is how I provide for my family. If I don't do this, how will I live? And Narada Muni said, you just have to become a devotee and you will be all right. Krishna will arrange everything for you. So by the power of Narada Muni, Magrari gave up the killing and he became a devotee and he sat beside the Tosi tree in the jungle and he began to chant the holy name and people would come and they would give him some grains and some rice or some fruit. 
and they would offer their respects to him because he had become a devotee and become he'd given up the hunting and became a devotee. So we have that experience in Krishna consciousness. There was one devotee in Germany. Uh, he, he became a devotee and sh uh, before he became a devotee he'd been working in a, a slaughterhouse killing the animals. But then he became a devotee. And he came and he surrendered to Prabhupada and he took initiation. And Prabhupada gave him a beautiful name. He gave him the very nice name. Mahajan, I think. So, this is the point that even somebody has demonic qualities, if they take to Krishna consciousness, they don't have to separately cultivate each and every quality. You just simply have to become the devotee and simply by taking part in the process of Krishna consciousness, then all the good qualities start to develop. Right? Are there any questions on chapter 16? Maharaj, there are two devotees who have uh, yes. uh, comments, comments also and few devotees have questions. So Sajirandhan Prabhu, you wanted to say something? No, Guruji, I was just giving the example and then I was holding my hand. Okay, so we'll take the questions. Uh, uh, Hare Krishna, Dhanavad Maharaj. <laughs> uh, one, in chapter 21, we have told that it is the last standard and greed. Uh, the last is same as desire. Here, last means desire. I'm, I'm sorry, Madhuji, voice wasn't too clear for me. Could you say again? Uh, sorry, man. I wanted to know this in uh, text number 21. The last is same as desire. Here, last means desires. Lust means desire. Well, lust is the particular... You, you see, desire can be good also. Mm. Because we can have desire for the service of Krishna. Okay. But lust indicates the, the mood, the particular mentality that I am the enjoyer, that this is for my pleasure, for my, satis my, my satisfaction. So it's a very selfish state of consciousness, right? That I, this is for me to enjoy. But desire could be good, it could, can also be bad. But lust is generally taken as a, a, a very bad quality, not, not pure. Anyway, it's, it's very much on the bodily platform. is like uh, now we say that if we kill an animal the next life uh, like uh, we will be killed in the same way or we will become animal and somebody will kill us so like uh, who will be killing is it like that same person who have we have killed or somebody else it is how it is <laughs> <laughs> well difficult to say exactly but certainly it's true in fact uh, they say when, when they when they kill the goat you know, that if you want to kill an animal, according to the Vedas, they can take a goat before the goddess Kali on the full moon night, or, or is it the dark moon night? Anyway, it's once in a month, only once in a month, and they have to go before the goddess Kali on that particular night, and then they should utter a mantra into the ear of the animal, that I am killing you, in the future you can kill me. So whether or not the animal will personally come, it may do. Certainly in the fourth canto Srimad Bhagavatam we have the example of Puranjan who was performing many animal sacrifices and Narada Muni warned him that these animals are waiting because he said, you have killed all these animals in Vedic sacrifices and you didn't do it properly. The sacrifice wasn't done properly, you're going to suffer and these animals are all waiting to get you in your future life. So again, if that is, again that animal or uh, 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 this, uh, who has killed again, they won't get incur in sins, Maharaj? They won't get what? 
sins, they don't incur sins again because of <laughs> killing again marriage. Well, animals don't get sins. Animals, that, that animal body is their karma, right? That animal body which they've got, that is the result of the past sins. The, in the human form of life, we get karma, we get sins. The tiger doesn't get sin for killing somebody. Or a lion, they don't get sins when they do something, you know, because they have the animal body. So they don't get karma for their activities, for their eating meat and so on. That body itself is their karma. Yes. Okay, Mataji, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have Maharaj uh, Smriti Karuna Uh, Maharaj, I am I am seriously not able to understand the living entity is finally, you know, a part and parcel of the Lord. How can we degrade to such a level? I know certain occults that the highest level is to keep youthful. And uh, and this is just the beginning of Kali Yuga, just five thousand years have passed. Uh, how could a living entity degrade to such a demoniac level, Maharaj. Such a demoniac level? Which, where, where was it you were talking about? The demoniac level? Where is, where is it described? Maharaj, I am, I am just asking that we just discuss the Ugra. Uh, Ugra Karma. Ugra Karma. That the living entities, they, you know, they, they get to such a demoniac level that they are killing, Prabhuji you gave the example of, you know, people in Australia that are killing camels and like that. And I've also heard of certain things that, you know, people take up to, you know, just be youthful. They do wrong things with small kids. And I was just wondering that how could a living entity degrade to such a demoniac level? What is the reason, Maharaj? I'm not able to understand. Well, the reason is ignorance. Basically, the problem is ignorant. The cause of sinful activities, maybe you remember when you were studying Nectar of Devotion, uh, it was described about sinful activities, and the cause of sin is due to ignorance. Yes. People are, have known, they don't have proper education about these things, about, about what is proper behavior. They don't know. They just simply don't know and they have no awareness, they have no consciousness. And you could also say it's due to the, their demonic birth because they're born maybe with the demoniac mentality from birth. Okay. And they never got the opportunity to associate with a Krishna conscious devotee. They never got the opportunity to hear spiritual knowledge and to understand the nature of life and the importance of life and having proper regard for all forms of life in different species. So it's basically ignorance, the cause of sinful activity and sinful activities cause suffering. And people don't know, nobody taught them. So this is a, the purpose of our Krishna consciousness movement, that we have to give people the spiritual education we have to awaken people to understand what is the proper behavior, right? We spoke in, in the, the last class, we spoke about, the, there was the verse, pravritim cha, nivritim cha. There is pa, pa, pravriti and nivriti. Pavriti, the things we should do, and nivriti, the things we should not do. So Srila Prabhupada said, our Krishna consciousness movement is changing the quality of pavriti and nivriti. Before becoming devotees, we were doing these terrible things. We were killing animals, we were torturing living entities, we had no respect for life. But after becoming devotee, then we change. The character changes, the qualities change. We won't even kill the insects. We, Prabhupada said, we will, a devotee will hesitate before killing an insect. Or like a mosquito, maybe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, 
next we have Apurva and Lecheva Swari Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Danu Pranam. Uh, in the 15th chapter, verse 20, it is written that how uh, the, uh, the demoniac people, they uh, degraded to the animals of, like cat and dog, and they don't have any chance of receiving mercy of God in, in any stage of later life. So, I did not understand because we all are part and parcel. So, even uh, though someone is degraded, but in later life, they can get mercy. I just want to have some clarification on this. Yes, later life. You see, for some people, it may take a long time before they get that opportunity again. Because they're so inimical, there's so much against the devotee. They're so demoniac. They're put into these demoniac species of life for many births. For many births, they become dogs or pigs. And they have to take they have to take these different kinds of births because they, they don't want Krishna consciousness. They don't want any other way of life. They just simply want to be in that body and the, the, they, have, they just have the demoniac nature so deep in them. So the opportunity to associate with devotees, it's, uh, you know, they just can't appreciate it. So they go in this, these bodies and they take birth in these different species and gradually they work off that karma. But it can take them a long time because they they're so sinful and because they're so ignorant. So they have to take birth again and again in these different species. And gradually, gradually, they may come back after some time, come back to the human form of life. And then in the human form of life, then they may be given the chance again to hear about Krishna consciousness or to understand the true nature of life and to recognize the spiritual nature within every living entity. But they have to, they have to wait, work off that karma before they can come back to the human form of life. And, uh, in the later, uh, in the uh, down is written that how, even though they take birth in animal species, it's like a uh, mercy of God, which I like, just want to some clarification. Mercy is offload because the karma get eradicated. That's why it's mercy of God. The, the demoniac species is the mercy of God. No, no. The, even though demoniac species, they take birth in the lower uh, class, like lower species, like cats and dogs. That is also a mercy of Lord. So yeah. this means because the karma is getting eradicated, that's why it's mercy of God. Yes. Well, also, you see that demoniac species of life, it's the mercy of God because that's what they wanted. And the Lord is fulfilling their desires. And they actually desire to get that demoniac species, to be in that kind of body. Because they're, they're very envious and very nasty and very irritable. And so they have the nature, and they have that nature just like some of these creatures. Some of, these, you, some of these dogs and hogs and crocodiles and like that, mosquitoes come, suck the blood from people and like that. So they have this nature. They just want to give trouble to other living entities. They don't have a very compassionate, they don't have any compassion, they don't have any kindness or gentleness. They're very harsh and very cruel and unkind to other people, other living entities. So they're put into the kind of body which is appropriate for their qualification, according to their qualification. And they stay in that body to work off their karma. Gradually, after some time, they will come back. It may take longer though, take, can take a long time. Some of these people, depending on how demoniac they are, they can be in these bodies for a long time. 
Gradually, however, they'll come back to the human form of life. And then they may be fortunate to hear about Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Mara. Hare Krishna Maharaj and Dr. Pranam. My question is uh, with reference to this uh, 16th chapter, verse 4. There is a word called Abhijhatasya. Okay, we can understand that uh, devotees uh, begetting children, they are naturally, they will be having all those complementary qualities and uh, the Krishna comes, children will be born. But what about other uh, <coughs> uh, families like uh, they are not devotees at all? But if somebody, some is called devotee, tries to uh, read either uh, <coughs> Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavatam, since the uh, child is in the womb of the mother, will it have any good impact on the uh, future child who will be born? If the devotee reads to the child in the womb of the mother, Maybe by force, they are not willing at all, but uh, he will try to explain about the advantages of hearing about the Lord and his glorious false times, etc. So he will make a sincere endeavor to go to them at least once in a week like that. I heard about one uh, such a devotee's attempt. So will it have a very uh, satuguna effect on the child? Well, well, it could do. It depends, it depends, however, on the child who's in the womb. Just like, you know, when, when you give a, a, you may give a lecture to people, is everyone receptive? Are they willing to hear? So the child in the womb is in a very uncomfortable, painful situation. But is, is, is he receptive to the message? Is, is he willing to to hear and to take it seriously. So also within the womb, the child has that choice, either to give full attention or maybe just to reject it. You see, it, it also will depend on the, the, the time of conception when the mother and father, when they conceived the child, what was their mentality? And that will determine the mentality of the soul which is attracted into the womb. And then if the mother is sitting watching television all the time or watching movies and after she has a bit, well, after she's conceived the child, what kind of activity is the mother doing, what kind of food is she eating and so on, this will also affect the child. So it's not just the, the devotee, the devotee is certainly trying, there's some benefit there, but how much benefit we don't know. That will depend on so many other factors. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Mara. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Next we have Hare Shri Hare Krishna Mara. Maharaj, uh, the Southern food item puts doubts like onion and garlic which come into more of ignorance. But uh, when we are preaching, uh, it sometimes it gets difficult to tell them to leave onion garlic because it comes under vegetarian, that's what people are doing. So how do we convince them? Yes, the onion and garlic are, they're actually aphrodisiacs. Aphrodisiacs mean they stimulate the lust and the passion in the body. So they're very powerful things. Uh, of course, people will say, well, if I don't use onion and garlic, then the food has no taste and they want something with taste to eat. They enjoy the taste. And so Srila Prabhupada taught us that instead of using onion and garlic, we put hing or asafatita and you use a little asafatita in place of onion or garlic. And this is not so damaging, it's not, it's not an aphrodisiac, it's not going to stimulate our lust. We're all, we already have lust and if we take onion and garlic we become more lusty. And, you know, these onion and garlic are highly pungent. 
people eat it, you know, when, when they come near you, you can smell it on their breath. It's so strong, you know, it knocks you back sometimes. They eat so much onion and garlic, they stink of it. So, uh, this is one point that it, it's very much in the mode of passion and ignorance. It's not good for helping us to control our mind and senses. I've heard also that uh, some airlines, they will not allow their pilots to take garlic after, uh, before flying an aeroplane, because the garlic influences their judgment, and their, their mental, their different judgments and decisions which they make. It's it not, can slow people down, apparently. It what? They say the garlic, it has to be choked garlic, um, can slow down their mental reflexes. Don't think so quickly. Yeah, right. Yeah, affects, affects their mental reflexes, right. And I also see garlic grew out of a dead cow. The, the first garlic came out from the dead cow. So I know that the Buddhist people, Buddhist people, they won't eat onion and garlic. They're, veg they're vegetarian. They also won't take onion and garlic. They know it's not a, not a sattvic food, not a pure food. So these are some points. You can tell them it grew out from the dead cow. That's where it came from. It's not actually a pure food, pure vegetable. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, this text 21 where it says that like we discussed the three gates to hell is lost, anger and greed and where Krishna is saying that these are the demoniac uh, qualities but we do see like even being devotee you know the anger and lust and greed still is there. So how do we, you know, <laughs> understand that, that, I mean, even though practicing for so many years, that it, it, it's not gone yet, these demonic qualities. So that does that mean that they will be existing for longer time and it's like very difficult to take it out or, um, uh -huh. yeah. Well, uh, these qualities can also be used in the service of Krishna. You know, the, one can have lust for Krishna. One can be angry. If, if we see a devotee ill-treated or somebody blasphemes the devotees and says something nasty about devotees, we can be angry and defend the devotee. And we can be greedy for Krishna's service. So these qualities can be used in the service of Krishna. But we have to be careful. Just like anger, if you use anger, unless you're in control of your mind and senses, then it can degrade you. So, as you say, it, it takes some time. It depends a lot on how we're practicing. You say we're practicing for years. Well, remember, we've been in the material world for a very long time. We're conditioned souls. We're called Nityapada, eternally conditioned. It means we've been here such a long time that we're considered eternally conditioned souls. So it's going to take time to, pure, to get rid of these bad, bad habits. It's go, it is going to take some time. We have to work very hard. We have to be very intense and very determined can get rid of these qualities, these tendencies. Okay. It, it will Thank you, and Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yeyatamam prapajante tams tataiva bhajamiyam. As you surrender, I reward you accordingly. So when we really commit ourselves to Krishna's service, then Krishna can take all these bad qualities away from us. And we should very much regret if sometimes we lose the control, we get very angry or we become very greedy, we should repent. 
And we should feel very sorry that we've done that and apologize and try to overcome these tendencies. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, Hindu Lekha Kripa Mataji has another question. Uh -huh. um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I just would like to ask you, like all the anger arise from lust, Maharaj? See, we say that the anger arises from lust. All the anger does it arise from lust only? Well, that's what Bhagavad Gita says. But sometimes we get angry for uh, like uh, for the Lord's purpose if somebody blasphemes or something like that, we get angry. So is it also because of lust only, Maharaj, then? Well, that's using the anger in the service of Krishna is a little different. Yes. If we get angry when somebody blasphemes a devotee or when they, they blaspheme Krishna, we, we, we may get angry, we can use, use our anger in the service of Krishna. So that is transcendental anger. Okay. But we have to be careful, we have to be careful that you have to be in control. Prabhupada would get angry one minute, but the next minute he would drop it. it w he wouldn't allow it to, he wouldn't carry the anger. You know, sometimes people, they get angry and they're angry for three days or more. They, they, they can't just give up the anger. They carry that anger with them. So that kind of anger is very degrading. Very hard to think of Krishna. Remember that we have to think of Krishna. We have to remember Krishna. So if that anger is causing you to forget Krishna, it's not good. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, we have Sachin and then Vishnu Prabhu. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, yes, uh, you were uh, telling about how people to develop the good qualities, that uh, they will be by chanting and by devotion service one develops the good qualities automatically. So I was just um, thinking, we also see that devotees uh, uh, have, don't have good qualities simultaneously and uh, the non-devotees who are uh, not interested in devotional service, but they uh, externally have, uh, seem to be very good in qualities. I'm just trying to understand that. Yes, we're we are looking at the material qualities, we're not seeing the, the important quality which is surrendered to Krishna. The non-devotees, they appear to have good qualities, but they have not surrendered to Krishna. So their good qualities are all under the control of the modes of nature. But sometimes they have good qualities and other times it's, it's not that they have all good qualities, but they're just situated under the modes of nature. And sometimes you see them, you, you appreciate their mode of goodness, but they're also subject to passion and ignorance. And the devotees, you look at them with material vision, you don't see their spiritual position, you don't see that they've actually surrendered to Krishna. So they may not have good qualities, but gradually they will develop the, the good qualities. Whereas the people who are not devotees, they're not going to, they're going to become worse and worse all the time. But the devotees will become better and better as time goes on. Because their devotees have surrendered to Krishna. But the non-devotees haven't surrendered to Krishna. So they're under the modes of nature and they're going down and down and down, gradually more and more down. Although you see them, they look good, they, that's, that's a temporary situation. In the long run, they're going to go down into the uncom unpleasant, inauspicious situation. But the devotees, they may not look very good. You may think they don't have good qualities, but gradually they will develop all the good qualities. Because they're connected to Krishna, because they're doing service for Krishna, so gradually all the good qualities will develop in them. It's just going to take time. Just like if somebody's in the shower, having a shower, you can't criticize them for being dirty. 
So in the same way, a devotee is practicing Krishna consciousness. You can't criticize them. You, you, you have bad qualities. Oh, you should, you're like that. Oh, you're lazy. Oh, you're dirty. Oh, you're greedy. No, they're devotee. They may not have such good qualities, but gradually, if they continue in Krishna consciousness, they will develop better and better qualities. It's just going to take some time. We give the example, the green mango and the ripe mango. You just have to leave the green mango, you just have to leave it to ripen. It's going to take some time. So these devotees, because they are engaged in Krishna conscious activities, gradually, one day, they will develop the good qualities. So we have to be careful for that tendency. Because the nature of the mind is to look externally. We only look at the external, we only look at the immediate, and we think, oh, that person, he's, he's so nice, he's got such good... And then, and these devotees, oh, they're so bad, oh, they're so foul. No, we should see what is the actual position. In the long run, somebody who is not a devotee, they cannot have any good quality. And this is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, 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 yes. Oh no, that's a different verse, right? Yes, 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 Right? One who is a devotee actually has the good qualities. But one who is not a devotee is just under the most of nature. Even though he may appear to have good qualities, sometimes he has good, but he's under the most of nature. It's not going to be always there. So don't be fooled. If someone is not a devotee of Krishna, even though they're expert in maintaining their family, or they may be expert in pranayama or mystic yoga, but if they're not a devotee, they have no good qualities. They're, all, they're under the modes of nature. Sometimes they're in goodness, but sometimes they're also in passion and ignorance. But a devotee, because he's engaged in Krishna conscious activities, gradually he will come to the transcendental platform. He just has to stay in Krishna consciousness. It's going to take some time. Is it clear? Thank you, much. Yes, any other questions? Uh, there are no other hands raised. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we'll go on to chapter 17. We can begin looking at chapter 17. Mm. Oh no, not that. Is everyone able to see the slideshow? Uh, yes, Maharaj, we can see the slideshow. Yes, Maharaj. Very good. Okay, revision. I think we covered all these things. Is everyone okay with this? Quiet? Anything you'd like to review again? No? Okay. So we'll go ahead. Chapter 17 is uh, Divisions of Faith. 
So connection to chapter 16, the previous chapter, comes in the very beginning, the very first verse. Yashustra vidim utsrijya vartate kama karata nasasadim mavapnoti nasukam na param gatim. 1623 was saying, he who disregards scriptural injunctions and acts according to his own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination. Does everyone remember that verse? Nasasadim. Siddhim, perfection, na sukam, happiness, na paramgatim, the supreme destination. Right? Shastra vidhi, one who, Shastra vidhi means the, the direction of the scriptures, but utrichya, they give up, they give up the directions of the scriptures and they act independently. Kamakarata. They do what they want, they act their own, have their own ideas. So the, re, the result, na sasadim avapnoti, na sukam, na param gatim. They cannot get perfection, they cannot be happy, they cannot achieve the supreme destination. Because they've given up the scriptural teachings. Very important, remember, the divine nature is to follow the scriptural injunctions and the demonic nature to reject the scriptural injunctions. So then in the 17th chapter, Arjuna asks a question, right? Arjuna asks, if one with faith follows some rules which are not mentioned in the scriptural injunctions, what is his position? Can you understand Arjuna's question? Ya shastra vidhimutrijya ya janti vita. Somebody with faith follows some rules which are not in the scriptures. What is his position? So he's got faith, but he's got faith in something which is not in the scriptures. Of course, we see there, there's a lot of this kind of thing. They, have, they believe in something, but there's no scriptures, there's no scriptural evidence to support it. He said, I believe, I believe. So, divisions of faith. Trividha bhavati shraddha. Well, Arjuna wanted to know what will be his position. He has faith. So Krishna says, well, it will depend on what kind of faith he has. It depends on if his faith is in goodness, then he will be in goodness. If his faith is in passion, he'll be in passion. If his faith is in ignorance, he will be in ignorance. Three kinds of faith. It's not all one. There are different kinds of faith. Dehinam sa swabhavaja, according to his mode of material nature. Somebody is in the mode of passion, somebody is in the mode of ignorance, somebody may be in the mode of goodness. So they will have faith, similar faith, influenced by their situation in the modes of nature. Srila Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada says, could somebody read? We can have someone read. Yes. Uh, as long as one's faith is not completely in purified goodness, the faith is subject 
to contamination by any of the modes of material nature. The contaminated modes of material nature expand to the heart. Therefore, according to the position of the heart in contact with a particular mode of material nature, one's faith is established. 17.3 Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Ma'am. So, as long as our faith is not in purified goodness, purified goodness meaning like shuddha sattva, no influence of passion and ignorance. So, as long as we're not in that condition, our faith is subject to contamination. Sometimes it will be in goodness, sometimes in passion, sometimes in ignorance. Yes. So, someone can read. Who is going through? You want to read? Yeah. Divisions of faith. So people are being controlled by the three kinds of material nature, and if they do not follow the sastric injection, then he will concoct. He will create something according to his version, either in the tamoguna or rajoguna or sattvaguna. Yes, a bit more. He is going on, conducting himself under the influence of the same modes of nature. For those means, superficially doing something in the Tamoguna, he will not be successful. He will not be successful. Yes, Sastra Vidhim Sutrijya Varate Kama. Bhagavad Gita 17, 1 to 3, on July 14, 1970. Thank you, Maharaj. So by this means, superficially doing something in Tamagun, he will not be successful. He's given up the injunctions of scriptures. Thus we find different types of faith in this world, and there are different types of religion due to different types of faith. Do you all agree? Yes, Maharaj. Can you give some examples about faith in the mode of goodness or religion in the mode of goodness? I think that's the next exercise. Yeah, this is this is actually for you to do. <laughs> Select some modern religious practices and discuss their merits and demerits. Give specific reference to Krishna's analysis of faith in the modes as described in Bhagavad Gita chapter 17 and compare these practices to the practice of Krishna consciousness. So maybe we, we can have some groups. Yes, can we put, how many people do we have today in the class? I think we have 31, so about, I think we'll have to have six groups. Six groups? Five in each Five in each group, Yes.
Bhavani group. They wear this uh, uh, the red okay. and pink colored dress and they do only that uh, Durga Varshay. And they follow certain rules and regulations only for a certain period. After that, they will become normal again. Okay. So, so that will be in the mood of passion or ignorance I think. It, it, it should be in the mode of passion only. It cannot be considered as sattva guna. But uh, even this uh, worships or worshippers of Baba Sandal also, they also do all those uh, nonsense things and uh, they claim that they are doing it as well uh, uh, religion karke. But that is not correct. And uh, yes. one more thing, you must have heard about this uh, Swami Ayappa, Saraname, Swami Musa, Saraname Ayappa. I have, seen, yes. I have seen many people who follow that religiously for a particular period, like two or three months. And uh, the very, like, uh, uh, austerities, uh, you can't imagine. Such kind of austerities they may observe. But at the end of that uh, program, like, they go to that uh, Severi Malay, and after coming, you know, I have seen literally one fellow who went into the liquor shop and drank fully and uh, fell down there only. So the, what is the use of such things? You can't uh, call it as a religion. <laughs> and yes. they claim, yes, uh, we do a lot of austerities, uh, we do a lot of fires activities during that period, only that particular period. Again, after that, they'll become even uh, much worse than the ignorant people. Yes. So I have seen such things. So I think most of them will be in passion and I think that Osho one will be in the mode of ignorance because it's totally against uh, the scriptural uh, thing. Yes. They have their own ideas. Sadhguru somewhat, uh, I heard his uh, lectures and all, uh, he teaches good principles also. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't know whether we are too selfish talking about uh, elevating only Krishna consciousness, but uh, yes, certainly we are far superior than all these religions. Because the religion which is prescribed in the Vedas is like worship Supreme Lord. The, all the sacrifices should be for the pleasure of Lord. When that fundamental aspect is not observed, what is the use of religion? Whether it, whatever mode you are in, but if this fun, basic thing is not observed, then it's useless. And I think even uh, Muslims also, they might come in the mode of ignorance because they teach um, that to kill others who don't accept their religion. Yes. So, but is let us hear from uh, Sechiputra Prabhu and uh, Vrinda Mataji. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah. Sechiputra Prabhu. Hare Krishna yes. Maharaj. Yes. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare. So in, and because in Indonesia, in our uh, Balinese tradition is like a, a different kind of Hindu. So it is more uh, uh, worship of the ancestor. <laughs> actually, because of the, the uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, who, uh, Rasi who spread this uh, uh, Sanatan Dharma, this was uh, like uh, only once like coming so it's just like uh, uh, disconnect you know like so uh, mostly uh, because of their uh, don't have knowledge and uh, also become tradition so they they, they thought this is like uh, what's that mm, uh, the the real uh, uh, purpose of what yeah, that nowadays people are having all the pseudo gurus. I guess that is the thing which will come under you know the modern faiths because we need to have a bona fide spiritual master, not the ones who show some mystic power. It's a yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Are you having a good discussion? Just started, Maharaj. Maharaj, what would be the possible modern religions? Matlab, I, I mean, exactly. We are, we are considering the point of pseudo gurus. Will that come under that, Maharaj? Pseudo gurus? Yes. yes that will come under the mode of ignorance or passion. 
and and the way they say that you know they, they fulfill the material desires that that one has about business and family and all these things yeah that's more the mode of passion okay. so we were discussing the, this as you know under modern religion uh -huh. and comparing this with our sanatan dharma all right yeah good Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah. yeah, because people are already in the bodily platform, so when they see those kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, what do you call, the benefits or uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, the positive things which are beneficial for them, then they get uh, attracted. All right, all right. Yeah. Keeping this in mind, our Bhakti Purushottam Maharaj has also started our uh, tribal preaching. So we connect to people, we are in yeah. school, uh, we have been building schools and connecting to them so they, do their, they don't convert and they stick to their own religion. So that way it is very, we are seeing the positive result also, in not just Kashmir, few other backward places. Yeah. Uh, may I add one more thing, Babu? Yes, no. So, Nowadays, uh, the trend uh, following yoga practice is uh, mm -hmm. becoming more popular. So they try to find peace or uh, improve their health uh, by practicing yoga. But they lose the, the, the meaning of, of what, what yoga uh, really means. Yeah. It, it happens in uh, many parts of the world. But I think they don't connect this to any spirituality. They just do it for their uh, yes. physical health and all. But uh, I don't think, I'm not seen anywhere that they connect to any religious practices. Just for uh, health's sake they do, right? Uh, yes. Even the meditation also people, blood sugar trying to do and all so much meditation. But they don't know on what to meditate. Yeah, that is there in India, different uh, organizations are there. They Tell like this, they have to meditate on Brahman or like we see in the different places. Yeah. Hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Is everyone back? Still devotees are joining Maharaj. Are they, have they all come back now? Not yet. Okay, take a little longer. You close the room, so? Yes. 
closed before time. Actually, we were having 54 seconds. I just wanted to share one more thing with our group leader, Harish Sri Mataji. Madhavi Mataji. Okay. Go ahead. Well, you can share it with us when we're all together. Yes, that's so, right. Yeah. We can share it with us. So, we had the six groups. So, uh, group one. All right. Yeah. Each group have a spokesman. Yeah, we had in a group one, we had Anandila Mataji, Apurva Nila Chinswari Mataji, Karuna Sindhu Prabhu, Soumya Mataji, and Shyam Kunda Prabhu. So, you can... Okay, Anandalina Mataji, go ahead. Hare Krishna. Uh, we discussed uh, some of the groups, uh, the spiritual groups, like, uh, you know, uh, they, they do all uh, this kind of um, social service act, they distribute books and food, um, and have these charitable hospitals, um, and uh, have some universities also to that extent. And they are doing this kind of social service so that kind of attracts people in general because they are all still the bodily concept so when they see all these kind of benefits which are being given to them that kind of attracts them and uh, there are merits to this like because they are providing these kind of uh, facilities uh, and resources to the society in general and uh, uh, the demerit is actually that it's as this i said that it's all on the bodily platform and you know the actual preaching like what uh, our iskon movement or proper taught us we are actually uh, trying to uh, you know get the conditioned souls giving them that knowledge uh, to reach to the lord uh, to go back home uh, but whereas the other religious uh, societies are kind of missing the point many of them and the other one, a religious institution is like uh, something called the art of living, and uh, which they, I think, do mostly focus on meditation and things like that. So actually, Prabhupada taught us the art of dying, um, though they are teaching us this material art of living, probably, but it's not going to help. So it's just going to end with this life. Um, and then we spoke about some Buddhists, uh, they are also doing non-violence and all these things. But again, it's all more of goodness, probably, but again, it's binding the soul uh, in this material world. Um, and all the other institutions, they are lacking that spiritual compassion, which Prabhupada has taught uh, to, you know, uh, to uh, uh, preach them to get back home. So. Yeah, I think that's what, maybe if Karuna Sindhu wants to add something, if I missed anything. Well, yeah, this I would like to ask about the Buddhist, that the Buddhist in general there, you know, as you say, they do welfare work, yeah, they do some welfare work, but they also have a lot of, of their own educational programs. And they teach people meditation and they teach also their Buddhist philosophy. They have a lot of books, a lot of uh, propaganda. <laughs> you know, they're always publishing and writing and publishing. And they do try to give their philosophy out to people. So, is that the mode of goodness? Yeah, I mean, I guess so, because they are still, uh, you know, following a certain way of lifestyle, meditation. It's in the mode of goodness, but not, it's, I don't know how much is going to help transcend that, uh, the material modes of nature. But yes, it's a good platform to uh, practice uh, mode of goodness. But there's, they, they propagate atheistic philosophy. They say ultimately there's no God and nothing is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's not going to help us, uh, you know, have the relationship with the Lord because if atheism is being, uh, is being uh, propagated, then how is that going to help 
develop, uh, you know, the samanda with the Lord. Yeah, they don't believe in Lord. They don't believe in Vedic scriptures. They don't believe in any God or create. And they and they think that the whole world is not real. Nothing is real. Yeah, so yeah. there's a and lot of really there's a lot of the mode of ignorance there. Yes, 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 yes. And and I remember that in uh, when we did I think nectar of instruction or nectar of devotion. I don't remember. But there it was said that to the followers of Rupanuga, we don't accept them as preachers, the followers of Bud Buddhists, because they are into atheism. Yes, they're atheists. Mm. Atheistic culture. And you can see the result. When you look at Buddhist countries, you can see some, the, some these Buddhist countries are among some of the most degraded countries in the world. They're so hedon hedonistic, they're so addicted to sense gratification. So people, but at the same time they attract many followers. And because as you say, they do also welfare activities, some kind of welfare work, some kind of programs to engage people. But all on the bodily platform. What about something like Mother Teresa? Yeah, we discussed um, that as well. Like, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have heard, but I don't know exactly. But, uh, you know, they do all these social welfare activities, you know, feeding the poor and all, but they're feeding meat. So, how is that actually? Uh, helping people, I mean, they are happy, they're getting something to eat, but is that food purifying? So that that's the question. I mean, it's got, also does is a midday meal school program and khichri and all, but because it's offered to the Lord, so it is purifying. At some point, it, it will act its effect, uh, but I know, <laughs> but, you know, feeding meat, how, how is that going to help? Um. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's hear from another group. Hare Krishna Maharaj. We discussed about the different this one of uh, establishing the Ganesha and Durga idols during Ganesh Chaturthi and uh, Navratri time really which is not established according to scriptures. Maybe worship is there, worshipping Ganesha and uh, Durga or the goddess uh, uh, is there, but uh, publicly, I, uh, like uh, establishing them in every house or on the streets or whatever, and then worshipping is really not mentioned, which is not uh, according to scriptures or any Shastra or anything like that. Well, well I, I just saw yesterday Somebody sent me a quote from the seventh canto Srimad Bhagavatam where Prahlad where is talking about the different types of devotional service and it, under Archana, if you look there, under Archana, then it describes that one should not neglect to worship uh, Vaikuntha deities like Ganesh. Uh, Maharaj, this is not about worshipping the this one because really here, uh, like uh, in Mumbai or South India, wherever, like we have seen that uh, they uh, keep the idols of uh, Dur uh, Durga or during Navaratri and uh, Ganesha during Ganesh Chaturthi. Everywhere, every nook and corner, they will make a small pandal type and they keep there and they worship it. Really, they don't have any proper Brahmana or anything. The whole day, they'll keep it closed and only in the evening, little bit puja they do and they offer something and they will just, on 11th day, they do the Visarjana or they will put it in water and uh, do the Visarjana. So, uh, Navaratri also, on the, after 10th day, after uh, Vijay Dashami, they will uh, uh, do it in the, this one, in water they will put it. It's very famous here in South India, especially in Mumbai, Ganesh Chaturthi is very famous. <coughs> 11 days from Ganesh Chaturthi till uh, uh, like 11th day, just about, from this 11th day, they will do it uh, 
Uh, also, you're talking about that particular worship of a, temp a deity just for a few days. They make a deity. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. So they do it only for 11 days on Ganesh Chaturthi and for 10 days for Durga and all during the Shera time. But according to scripture, you can make a deity out of different elements, right? So yes, one of the elements... Yeah, yeah, I don't know about the uh, Visarjan or... Uh, Nimanjanya, that was no, Maharaj, putting it in the water and dispersing it again. So that is done really here. Well, that, been, that what uh, do we do with deities after when we want to disperse them? We also put them in water. Yeah, okay. I think, okay. you know, we, if you make a deity out of sand or out of paper like that, what are you going to do with it? You know, eventually it will go you have to put it some. you put it in, into the sea. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Maharaj, can I comment something on this? Yeah. Yeah, the whole history of uh, worshipping Ganesh in those 10 days, 10, 14 days, was started by Ganga, Bal Ganga Dhartila yes. at the time of, at the, time of uh, the, you know, independence fight. Oh. To bring all the Hindus together, to fight against the, the Britishers. Oh. That was the whole idea. And that has become into a religious kind of a thing at the present, which is which is a concocted thing, which was not not as per the scripture. This is what I'm saying. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. That is what we were discussing. So it's just a, con it's not a, a very long time standing tradition. It's something no, no. more recent times, is it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yes, yes go ahead, Manaji. Yes, and uh, we also discussed about the different, uh, like, uh, uh, people who are, uh, for example, these uh, Jaggi Vasudev, somebody is there, uh, he's, I don't know, his, this one also, he has put some uh, big uh, Lord Shiva statue also in the, in Koyambutu, his place, and all, he is doing all kinds of uh, giving politically also or giving the lectures on like the lifestyle of living similar to like art of living and all so which is not according to the scriptures or which is not having any they do some meditation or something like that but it is of no use it's all everything on the back body the platform they have different even western countries i think they have different kinds of uh, religious practices Example, Bahamai people, I think they do the, I, think, I don't know what is it, impersonal or atheism. There is no proper descriptions for their uh, practices. Mm. So their practices are more the mode of passion, ignorance. ignorance. Yes. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. All right. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj. Okay, we can go ahead. Group three. So we discuss like different uh, practices and different modes. So in the mode of goodness, we discuss the art of living. And even uh, the Sai Baba followed the Sai Baba, even though it's not according to the scriptures. Even there is no mention of Sai Baba in the scriptures anywhere. But uh, people do worship him as a god. Um, so that was one thing. And then uh, uh, Murli Bhuvan Prabhu even gave example of uh, the worshipping Shab Shabri Mala. Uh, so they for one whole month, they people will be like uh, very religiously, they will follow everything. Uh, so much penances they will do. But at the end of the thing, they will be uh, again back to that eating non-veg or uh, drinking liquor and uh, all that thing. So it's like... Uh, it may be in the mode of passion or maybe some more goodness. And then in the mode of ignorance, we discuss different uh, religious practices like Muslims. Uh, there, it's like not according to the scriptures. So they uh, tell that you should kill those who don't follow, uh, those who uh, don't convert to Muslims. So you are allowed to kill and you'll get uh, heaven and like that they have some like, uh, Thing. And even that uh, 
followers of Osho, uh, so they are involved in two sense gratification. But people who are into that, they like to join that for that thing, and they think that it is a religious practice. So it's like uh, totally on into mode of ignorance, and even the uh, Nityananda does that uh, person. So he he claims himself to be an incarnation of God, and he do all kinds of nonsense activities. So all these things, I uh, it's like not beneficial. You see, uh, uh, I mean, nowhere relate, related to religion. Uh-huh. And uh, Murli Govind Prabhu also had something to share. Hare Krishna Maharaj Dandavat Pranam. Maharaj, a few years back, uh, when I was in service, actually, one uh, Swami called Swami Sukhavadananda. He is uh, somewhat attached to this Chinmaya mission. He was uh, taking one verse from uh, Bhagavad Gita in that particular session. He was uh, explaining about that. And uh, he initiated some uh, members also at the end of the program, that is a three days program. So he had given some mantra, I didn't remember also. So fortunately I was out of the clutches of that particular process uh, as soon as I got the entry into his car. But he has got uh, lots of followers throughout the world. He conducts two programs, one is called Life and another one is called Existential Lab. That is in the lab of the nature, uh, he gives some kind of uh, teachings how to live the life. So I, I really wondered, see, even the food also, they give the food with onion, garlic and all. So these kind of, uh, Swami, he is in saffron dress. He preaches a lot of things. He quotes a lot of uh, Vedi, Vedic injunctions. But what is the real news? But, but he has got so many followers, Madhanas. So these kind of people, uh, outwardly they look, they are in the Sattvaguna mode because they teach about Bhagavad Gita. That is for their livelihood. He earns lakhs of crores of rupees. In fact, our own organization, Hindustan Petroleum, engaged him as a uh, faculty for about two and a half years for more than 3.5 crores worth a day. Sorry, what happened? Uh, the, that person was uh, <coughs> engaged as a faculty for teaching this life science to all our office of community for about uh, two years for a deal of about 3.5 crores all weekends. The what co- simply he, uh, he used to do is take one sloka from Bhagavad Gita and give lecture of one hour. That's all. And the faculty were paying him 3.5 crores? Yes. Yes, bro. Yes, Maharaj. Mm-hmm. Sorry. My goodness. <laughs> because it gives some kind of temporary relief to the listeners, the audience. In fact, I was one of the sufferers like that. But I was a little fortunate that I came out of the clutches of that. They used to invite me for satsangs and all. Of course, a few days I went. Then Badma, I stopped everything. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, many people like to use the Bhagavad Gita to present their own philosophy. Was he presenting his own philosophy? He used to add all those emotional elements to that particular sloka and he used to conduct some group activities also. Like suppose there are 200 members used to divide into some 20 or 30 odd groups and used to give some kind of uh, activities on that. And subsequently, I realized what are those activities which are totally related to Bhagavad Gita only, nothing but pure teachings of Bhagavad Gita and used to claim that is his own concoction. Hmm. Yeah, the teachers will find a cheater. So, so is that the mode of goodness, passion or ignorance? So, according to me, it is not uh, in the mode of goodness, Maras. 
it is fashion for his uh, livelihood he takes this base bhagavad gita base because if you quote it is a lot krishna spoke to this where lot krishna explained all these things and people will be a little bit uh, attractive but uh, where is the question of following all this vedic uh, injections in that subsequently i realized of course i was not knowing about the modes and all at that time it was way back in uh, 2002 okay thank you very much prabhu Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. All right. Next group. Group number four. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, we were discussing about uh, uh, Sura Gurus, uh, where the people come and people will approach them for the instant results. So it comes under the mode of passion and ignorance. But uh, the people who are in mode of goodness, they will approach the uh, Thank you very much. Very nice analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Group number five. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, so we discussed Maharaj broadly four categories of uh, worshippers. One is from Christian faith. One is from uh, Shiva worshippers. One is the uh, the worshippers who worship the ghosts. and the other is the yoga practitioners of hatha yoga so firstly we spoke on christianity and uh, uh, devotees brought a nice point that jesus christ is actually the son of god he came to india and learned many teachings there and he preaches on love of god um, there are some followers in the mode of goodness who take pure teachings and they try to follow his uh, rules properly and then in, uh, in indonesia one devotee is there acharya nanda prabhu he said that it's very easy to preach to them in krishna consciousness because they know many principles and then they they are very favorable they become so they are they are in mode of goodness but simultaneously there are some in the same faith there are some people who who do this uh, reiki and who just do this holy water and they just say if somebody is is sick they get them on the stage and they say oh you are you are you are healed so that is in mode of ignorance which does not have any basis of scripture they just do it as publicity stunt to to convert people to christianity so that is in the mode of ignorance and then we spoke about the shiva worshipers like some of them in the mode of ignorance they eat uh, ganja and they try to imitate shiva and say oh because shiva can take uh, these substances we can also take them on the same point we discussed in contrast in krishna consciousness we preach that uh, we should not imitate great personalities but we should follow their footsteps and um, then uh, mata ji said one uh, i think krishna marri mata ji said one nice point on the people in usa nowadays they practice uh, in some places upon calling upon ghosts and speaking to the ghosts it is like uh, has no scriptural basis but they want to connect with spirits and they think they can go into transcendental world by that means but in bhagavad gita we see krishna speaking to arjun saying that if you worship the ghost you'll go to the ghost <laughs> so krishna tells if you worship me you'll come to my planet 
So in Krishna consciousness, we worship Krishna and go to Krishna's planet. <laughs> uh, and then we... Yes, Maharaj? Yes, very good. And we spoke on the last point, Maharaj, on the Hatha Yoga point. We spoke that, yes, there are many organizations who, uh, who preach on uh, bodily exercises and uh, be calm and... Yeah, it, it is a kind of mixed scriptural basis, Maharaj, because we saw in previous chapters, Krishna also spoke about Hatha Yoga, Ashtang Yoga, but it culminated in uh, some way or the other uh, uh, realizing, uh, realization of God in its three aspects, like either Brahman, Paramatma or Bhagavan, but they don't have any of the substances of reunion with God. So it is not culminating in those so this also comes in kind of mode of uh, we saw like first worshippers mode of uh, passion also it comes because it's bodily concept so we saw all these points man. okay thank you very much very nice right is there one more group yes Maharaj Hare Krishna uh, I represent group number six uh, we discuss about uh, two other societies, uh, sorry, religious society, which is uh, Baha'ism and uh, Sridi Sai Baba. Uh, we came to a conclusion that uh, Baha'ism respects all religion. Uh, Sridi Sai Baba, he, he was a kind of a peacemaker. He encourages people to uh, take up Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavadam. However, there was no uh, proper understanding or deeper understanding from them because uh, as compared to our society where we base everything on Shastra and Vedic injunctions, so Srila Prabhupada has given us the essence uh, and also a definition of what pure goodness is. Uh, but the uh, other religious societies, they do charity work just to get some temporary relief and uh, trying to impress the people from the mood of passion and ignorance, telling that, okay, this is good. Whereas ours gives us a very clear understanding of what material world is, uh, where do we go from here, uh, after we leave our body, and it also reforms uh, personal characters, like uh, we see in the life of Daga and Madai, they were so ignorant, they were very passionate and they eventually got reformed by uh, taking up uh, the instructions from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to chant the holy name and they became good devotees Jai. and health devotees. <laughs> so their religious practice is all under the modes of nature. Practically we don't see, it's very less common to find anywhere where they present real transcendental religious principles, any real education to bring the people to a transcendental platform. Although there's so many different institutions and societies, they're so much influenced by the modes of nature and presenting things on the bodily platform. So this is the situation today. Srimad Bhagavatam is unique because it rejects all the religion which is motivated by this cheating principle, right? Kaitava Dharma. Oh, so much philosophy or religious practices, but it's all based on the modes of nature. Sometimes, often they, they want to get something material desires, fulfilling their material needs, economic needs, health needs, different things. But hardly we see anywhere where they're really thinking about love of God or even liberation. Okay. Maharaj, I think Harsha Dhanwani Mataji has uh, some points. Yes. Uh-huh. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my uh, humble obeisance. Uh, in the Brihad Bhagavatam, I had read that there are unlimited uh, uh, unlimited uh, jivas from Vaikuntha planets. They every day, they travel in their plane to planet Earth and other planets to actually 
takes us back to like Punthavar, Goro. So Maharaj, I was just wondering, where are those people going then? I mean, are all coming to planet Earth and then where on planet Earth would we? We know many of them are in Israel. But are they also going to other sampradayas and non-sampradaya uh, institutions? Well, we hope so. <laughs> we certainly hope so. With people from Vaikuntha, <laughs> that they're coming here. I heard that they don't come in the Kali Yuga. Oh no, it's the demigods that don't come in the Kali Yuga. We have to understand this is Kali Yuga, it's a very degraded time. So it's not a very attractive place for people from Vaikuntha to come. They have to be really compassionate. <laughs> and we have to understand also there are so many universes in the material world. There's an infinite number of universes, an infinite number, so many unlimited planets. There's so many souls to be delivered. And so, we are fortunate that we are coming just 500 years after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. So that is, that is to our good fortune that we could, be have, we could come in the human form of life on the earth planet in just only 500 years within the time of the appearance of the most merciful form of Lord Krishna himself who came with all of his associates from the spiritual world. So, we have that good fortune. Yeah, it's true, Brihad Bhagavad Amrita does talk about people from Vaikuntha coming and going, coming and they're performing kirtan. But Lord Chaitanya has come. He came and he performed kirtan. We simply have to follow his teachings. He left, he had his, his followers write books, and they, they rediscovered all the places of Lord Krishna's pastimes. So they have given us everything. We don't need any more. It's already there. You don't need people from Vaikuntha to come. If they did, if they did come from Vaikuntha, you wouldn't know. They won't reveal themselves. But we know Lord Chaitanya came and he, he came and his Goswamis came. They all came from the spiritual world and they rediscovered the holy places, they established temples, they wrote books. We have to take advantage of that. Right? She was not a part of Ishwan, but she was a part of a group where uh, their spiritual teacher was uh, indirectly related to Srila Prabhupada. And, and this Mataji has been learning all the things that we learn in Iskon. So, but it, uh, would that be termed as bona fide? Uh, so, I get confused whether this is or not or thing. Because if they are teaching Srila Prabhupada's teachings, then they should be a part of ISKCON. Generally, they should, but we have to understand ISKCON does not have a ISKCON does not have monopoly on pure devotional service. But pure devotional service can also be there. Other groups who are not directly a part of ISKCON. And since. Uh, Srila Prabhupada's departure, we've come to understand that. And even in Srila Prabhupada's time, the, there, were, there, was, there, were some, there was a disciple of Srila Prabhupada and he decided to go out of Iskon and Prabhupada sanctioned it. And Prabhupada gave him permission that he could go and, and that he could do his own preaching. And, you know, he was initiated by Prabhupada and he went and he did his own preaching and he, he had... He, quite good success. He has a number of disciples and followers. 
they're not directly ISKCON, but they're not different really from ISKCON, the same principles. So Prabhupada understood, you know, that you couldn't expect everyone's going to stay in ISKCON. We have two more hands raised. Yes. Is, uh, Smriti Karuna Mataji. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, I just heard in a lecture yesterday, Prabhuji was telling that there are, nowadays, as we see that there are many conversions, especially when we see in Christianity, they're offering jobs and they're giving food. So Prabhuji was telling this is not a new practice. That use this uh, conversion in faith used to happen before also. But that was totally on the basis of scriptures and religion. And he was telling that there used to be hardcore discussions between Shavites, Vaishnavas and the Shakhtas. And whoever won, the other, uh, the other party, the other ones, they had to with their followers follow. So this was the, uh, the actual way the conversions used to take place. Now they are on the basis of material conceptions, which is not correct. So there won't be elevations. But when we see ISKCON, ISKCON is literally following the, uh, the bona fide path. We are giving Harinam and we are distributing scriptures all over the world. And that is absolutely the bona fide way, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope it's true. We hope ISKCON will live up to your, <laughs> your words. Yes. But nowadays ISKCON is also distributing food. We're also giving out books free. <laughs> You know, we're also encouraging people to be a part of ISKCON. <coughs> you know, we're going to areas where, you know, we have like some devotees are going into tribal areas and areas, uh, primitive areas, un undeveloped areas, and where sometimes Christians have gone there. And we're also going there now, and we're also trying to convert people and bring people into Krishna consciousness. And how to attract people? Well, you know, Lord Chaitanya's program, of course, we attract people with the holy name. And Krishna Prasadam. And Krishna Prasadam is very powerful, and Prabhupada understood that many people had become devotees, had become his followers because of Prasadam. So, you know, that's a ISKCON bullets, right? Prabhupada had his gulab jamins, he called them ISKCON bullets. They could make a big difference to people surrendering to Krishna. And so, you know, other groups, you know, they may be giving some other economic incentives. You know, we're giving some incentive to the tongue, <laughs> giving them nice prasadam. Yes, Maharaj, transcendental. Yeah, well... Hmm. Yes, we hope it's transcendental. Thank you. Somehow or other, you know, we want people to become to take an interest in Krishna consciousness. Other people, they, you know, they 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 offered free education. They gave grants and so on like that. Sometimes we also, uh, in fact, we were for a while we were bringing young boys from Nepal. Young Brahmana boys come from Nepal, study in the Gurukula. We would do like, we had some sponsorship program to try to encourage people to become, to take up Krishna consciousness seriously. People need some, they do need some incentive these days, you're right. People, they need some incentive. We, we try to give a, with the spiritual incentive, give the knowledge, give the right. spiritual program. Somehow we have to always be thinking how to get, how to help people come into Krishna consciousness. And if that can make a difference, then sometimes it's, it's worth it. You know, if, if somebody genuinely wants to become Krishna conscious, but they just cannot because of maybe a family situation or some pressing economic situation, then it may be nice to help them. But it's not the best, of course. 
It's not the best. So thank you, Mary Jean. Thank you, Rav. Thank you, Rav. Mary Jean, we still have three more devotees. Okay. Please. Yes. So next is Ibulika Kripa Mahim. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I would like to ask the one this one Maharaj clarification. Now this some religious like gurus they proclaim themselves as like uh, that Ram Rahim Baba Ram Rahim or the Satya Sai Baba and all. They are uh, like making the followers and doing this uh, what is it, sexual exploitation of the girls and boys or whatever. So is it called as Ugra Karma Maharaj? Is it becomes like a Ugra Karma? Um, uh... I, I'm not so familiar with what exactly is going on, what they're doing with the girls and boys. I don't know. It sounds demoniac. <laughs> yes, my It is my I don't know about Ugra Karma, but it's certainly demoniac. Okay, my uh huh. Yes? Some other question? Yeah, Ananta Vilaspur. Uh, yes, thank you, Maharaj, uh, for uh, answering wonderful questions. Maharaj, my question is: You said that uh, we are slowly realizing that um, the aspect of pure devotion service is also in other organizations. So, how do we come to know that they are uh, also practicing pure devotional service? Like, um, in the sense, uh, what aspect? Like, if they are praying to. Krishna, the means is different, but Krishna is their the center of worship. Is that the aspect of your devotion service, Maharaj? Or um, how do we know? Like, I'm, I mean, yeah, we are like even Prabhupada was no way converting people's fates, as far as I know. But how do we realize the aspect of your devotion service being in others also and have that mentality? Like, like how do we? Well, we, we have to judge by the, the, their knowledge and by their detachment. By their detachment from material sense gratification and their knowledge of the Krishna conscious philosophy. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. So by, by the knowledge and what they are preaching, we can come to know. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, you, uh, I want to specifically ask, like there was a Western uh, spiritual leader who was very popular, even Prabhupada's time also, the same time, Yogananda Paramahamsa. Did you hear of him, Maharaj? Do they preach some pure devotion or...? Paramahamsa Yogananda was not yes, preaching, he was not preaching pure devotion, no. He was an, he's an impersonalist. Okay, impersonalist, Maharaj, okay. But... Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, man. But, you know, I mean, I, when I spoke about people, uh, b maybe not directly ISKCON, there were people like who came into ISKCON and who learned from ISKCON and then separated them and went on their own, went independently. And Prabhupada didn't stop it, he allowed it. You know, they, they had difficulty to work in the ISKCON, under the ISKCON management. So they went, he made their own institution. So sometimes these things happen. Of course, it's better if they can stay within the ISKCON society, it's certainly solidly connected to Srila Prabhupada or Srila Prabhupada's desire that we all work together. But Prabhupada also understood that there were some people who couldn't get along in ISKCON and he approved them going off and having their own institution, making their own, their own centers. And some, some of them did good. You have to judge by the result. Some of them were quite successful. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Th thank you, Maharaj, for uh, giving us so much insight. Yeah, any other hands are there? One yes, more? Yes, Maharaj, one for Murli Govind Prabhu last. Yes, Murli Govind Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Dandat Pranam Maharaj. Maras, how do we understand like uh, <coughs> when we go to uh, places for preaching and all, ours, I feel it is not a religious institution because this uh, dharma, whatever we are preaching, it is known as Sanatana dharma, which is not new. 
which is eternally it is available. Only thing we have to awaken this kind of uh, Sanatana Dharma which is there in uh, people's hearts also with the teachings of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srila Prabhupada. Even the purpose of uh, Bhagavad Gita written by Srila Prabhupada also very very understandable and uh, very easy to preach. No? So if somebody considers that our sees a religious institution, how to refute that Maharaj? For me, I know it's not a religious institution. You cannot treat it as a separate religion. What? Our ISKCON society, you mean? Yeah, yes, Maras. Yeah, we're non sectarian. Yeah. We're not against other religions. We accept the absolute truth is in all, all the revealed scriptures. Right. But you get the greatest, the best information in the. Vedic literature and in the supplements of the Vedas, like the Puranas. So, like that, that we, we recognize other religious traditions, Christianity, Muslim, Hindu, uh, Buddhist, like that. that they're also, they have, you know, they have their faith, they have their followers, they have their teachings. But we say, ours is the best. Ours is the most complete, the most complete in terms of Gyan and Vairag. Yes, when it's followed properly, then the Gyan and the Vairag is the best, the highest, the most complete philosophy, philosophical understanding, and the highest level of detachment. Okay, thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you for enlightening. Yes. Any other questions? That's all, Maharaj, for today. Okay. So thank you very much. We'll finish here today and we'll meet tomorrow. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gore back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.